Well, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, everyone. It's nice to be with you here on day two of this amazing conference brought to you by the Centre for Humanitarian Leadership. My name's Matt Tinkler. I'm the Deputy CEO at Save the Children Australia, uh, based here in Melbourne. And I'm also the chair of the governing committee for the Centre for Humanitarian Leadership and have had a really privileged opportunity to be involved with the CHL for quite some years now. Um, in Australia, it's our tradition to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting uh, you from. In my case, that's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge their continuing connection to this land for the last 65,000 years or more as one of the oldest continuing cultures on earth and honour any Indigenous Australians past, present or emerging. Um, I'd also like to pay special acknowledgement to the traditional owners and custodians of the land from wherever you are joining us from and honour their continuing connection to that land and their cultural wisdom that they bring uh, to us all. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed uh, day one of the conference. Uh, it's really exciting to be back here with you for day two. Uh, we're going to be joined by three wonderful panellists for some brief presentations in this plenary session. And then we will uh, have a, a panel discussion that I'll moderate um, towards the end of the session. So please uh, you know, get your questions ready and start thinking about uh, those that you can put in the Q&A function and make sure we have a stimulating discussion uh, with the panel. So uh, three panelists we have for you today, uh, we're gonna begin with uh, Lina Abirafe, who is the Executive Director of the Arab Institute for Women at the Lebanese American University. And Lena's gonna to talk to us about feminist leadership in an unequal world. Uh, Lena's presentation will be pre-recorded and coming to you and then our remaining panelists will be with us live. Um, second, we'll have uh, Arby Bagua, who's the founder of Aid Reimagined, uh, and Arby's uh, presentation is entitled Ethical Encounters in Aid. And then we'll have a presentation from Lena Sergi Attar, who's the founder and CEO of the Karam Foundation. Uh, her presentation is entitled Beyond the Buzz, Finding Humanity in Humanitarian Language. Um, Lena Abirafe is unable to join us for the panel uh, part of the proceeding, but we are lucky to have our our rock star um, presenter, Deegan Ali, who we all had a wonderful challenge from on day one of the conference who will join us and I'm sure keep that panel a lively discussion. Um, I just wanna mention uh, briefly our role at Save the Children. Uh, we're very proud to be a, a founding partner in the Centre for Humanitarian Leadership. Uh, the partnership um, was, has been supported by a number of significant donors to Save the Children, in particular the IKEA Foundation our founding donor who have continued to support the centre for many years. Um, we like to think we bring a good degree of practical humanitarian uh, capability and insight into the work of the centre. And of course, we are thrilled to partner with Deakin University, one of Australia's leading academic institutions um, to deliver university accredited courses through the CHL. I'm gonna introduce more formally now our, our first uh, speaker for uh, the panel session. So Lena Abi Rafe uh, is a global women's rights activist and the executive director of the Arab Institute for Women, as I mentioned. Uh, she spent about 20 years in humanitarian contexts working to end violence against women, uh, summarised by uh, one of her TEDx talks. If you uh, have a look online, I highly recommend spending some time looking at that talk. Uh, Lena speaks and publishes on issues such as bodily integrity, empowering women's groups, women's leadership, and then a need for a feminist response to the COVID global pandemic and its impact on women in particular. Uh, her book, Gender and International Aid in Afghanistan is based on her doctoral research. And Lynn is among the gender equality top 100 worldwide in 2018 and 2019, and is a 2021 Vital Voices Fellow. So please join me in thanking Lena for her presentation today, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, over to Lena. Hello, my name is Lena Abarafi. I'm the Executive Director of the Arab Institute for Women at the Lebanese American University. Um, I'm also a 20-year veteran of humanitarian aid work, working uh, to end sexual violence in places like Afghanistan, um, Congo, Central African Republic, Haiti, Nepal, Chad, 
So I've had a fair run around the world. Um, now for the last six years, have been at the helm of the Arab Institute for Women, which is a 48 year old um, hybrid that is both academic and activist, and it covers the 22 Arab states. Uh, it's an extraordinary place that espouses the feminist leadership that I'm here to talk to you about today. What I want to do is set the global context first because it's important to understand what the world really looks like for women today because we can't actually change what we can't see and we can't fight what we don't understand. So this is just to illustrate and to make the case. And once we see these kinds of things, it becomes impossible to unsee them. I think this is what galvanizes us, what fuels us, what makes us angry um, and what propels change. Because if there was ever a case for feminist leadership and its need now, it is what I'm about to tell you. We know that no country in the world has achieved equality for women. In every single place and in every single space, women have less choice, less voice, less opportunity, less access to resources, and we are still not able to fully participate in all aspects of public, political, social, economic life. It is unbelievable that we are still talking about equality um, and we have failed to achieve it. And what's more, achieving equality, working on gender equality, working on women's rights, um, fighting for women's fundamental freedoms is actually viewed as women's work. So here we are in it, trying to rectify the imbalance that we did not even create. So. What we do know is this though, the case is strong and it's everywhere. Gender equality is a non-negotiable. It's, it's a human rights imperative. It's a precondition for any kind of world that we want to live in, a world that we deserve to live in, that is safe and just and with respect and dignity and equality and opportunity and abundance. But at the current pace, we're putt-putting along. It's gonna take 100 years to close the gender gap. And that's evident across all sectors. Maybe the only promising one is education where the gender gap will close in little over 10 years. But at the same time, the majority of um, students who are out of school are girls. And we're still talking about illiteracy. I can't even believe that nearly half a billion women and girls are illiterate in a world where literacy is really the, the, a non-negotiable, a, a core, a, a minimum. If we talk about politics, that's where we see the most inequality and it's made the most visible because women in power in politics and leadership and decision making are rendered virtually invisible. I don't need to tell you how many women leaders there are and how we treat women in any kind of position of leadership as the exception and not as the norm. She's the first we keep saying, well, I don't know how much longer we need to keep saying that. And we know that 120 or so countries have actually never had a woman leader. To me, it's that's astounding. When it comes to violence against women, this is where it pains me the most because the statistics are there and they underestimate the reality. We say that one in three women and girls are gonna experience some form of violence in their lifetime. And if that's not enough of a case, I don't know what is. In fact, this global form of violence, violence against women is costing us $1.5 trillion. So imagine what we're doing to ourselves, to the world, to women, um, as a result of this and allowing this to continue for me is just uh, unimaginable. The economy, again, we know the case there. Um, women are unrepresented in all aspects of uh, leadership. Uh, they are barely uh, in, in C-suites, as we say. They are relegated to feminized sectors, to the informal labor market. They do most of the unpaid care work. All of this has gotten worse in the context of COVID. We're living a global emergency. This is a public health pandemic that has affected us all and women and girls who were already vulnerable prior to the pandemic are now um, facing increasing challenges. And all of that is made much worse um, when we look at other intersecting identities like race and class and, and uh, physical ability and ethnicity and um, refugee uh, status or whatever. So many different aspects of our identities that, that make us even more vulnerable already. I work in the Arab region right now, and that happens to be the region that is the worst in terms of social indicators. We need over 150 years to close our gender gap. And with the protracted crises, uh, resurgence of, of patriarchy, denial of women's fundamental freedoms, economic crises, government collapse, 
specifically in the case of Lebanon, and compounded by the Beirut blast that decimated half of the city in August, uh, this region is really in dire need. So if there was ever a place uh, to make the case for feminist leadership, it is there. Following the blast in Beirut, I wrote a piece about the possibility that we could rebuild Beirut as the region's first feminist city. And that means providing economic opportunity, uh, reforming the discriminatory laws, ensuring that physical space is designed in a way that includes and engages women and, and is better for everybody. So my argument was this, that if we can do it in a place like Lebanon, if we can turn Lebanon, a country that is already plagued by vast gender inequalities, into a feminist country with Beirut as its feminist city, I think that would be the most extraordinary accomplishment. So what do I mean actually by feminist leadership. I think the idea is the reform of individuals and institutions and the because the people and the systems both need to change if we're going to have the world that we'd like to see. That's the core of feminist leadership. So it's not about formal leadership. It's not about politics or power. It's not uh, that f feminist leaders are just female leaders. There is a different type of leadership that we're advocating for. That We're talking about a sea change. We're talking about dismantling the systems and the structures that have contributed to marginalization and oppression, not just for women, but for just about everyone. This isn't about providing services and just doing more and adding on. It's not about technical solutions because these are fundamental political structural problems. We need to reform, we need to dismantle, we need to disrupt the entire system. It's about providing opportunities. It's about choice, it's about voice, it's about change. It's about creating space for a new generation of young leaders that are already out there fighting the fight. They're the ones that are gonna finish the job that we've been unable to finish as the older generation. And when I look at them, I think, oh, I can't wait to retire because they're doing such an extraordinary job. Their movements are so inspiring and encouraging. I look at Chilean feminists chanting, the rapist is you. I look at Arab feminists on the street, young women who are leading the charge for change. These are the kinds of things that, that inspire me. So it's not just about formal leadership. It's not just the Trudeaus and the Jacinda Arderns, although they are both amazing. Um, and they're really doing their part for their countries and for the world to model the kind of leadership that we want. But it's about these de decentralized movements. It starts with the individual, it turns into the collective. Because feminist leadership for me is real leadership. It's about a movement, it's about a, a value system, it is global. It helps us see our own role in the wider ecosystem, helps us understand our place, our role, our responsibility, the duty we have to ourselves and each other for change. It's about agency, it's about ownership, it's about authenticity, it's about courage, collaboration, connection, community. It's power sharing, it's transformative, it's egalitarian, it's thoughtful, it's disruptive, certainly. It's a paradigm shift, that's what we want because the status quo is no longer good enough. What we want is to learn and, and also to unlearn the better ways of doing things that are gonna benefit everyone and this is needed now more than ever. What's been interesting to see is a couple of phenomenon that have driven this. Social media certainly plays a big role as a driver. And what that means is it's got the potential to, to mobilize people, to mobilize attention, accountability, and ultimately action. But social media is not the answer. You know, a hashtag doesn't necessarily translate into real change. And there's a downside to social media as well in that it's bringing new forms of discrimination um, and violence against women in particular. So how do we use these structures that we have to be able to fuel our movements without harming ourselves further. There's also a rise of a social purpose where we are more conscious consumers, where we put our money where our values are, where we are careful about who we support and what that means and what that does for the world. And if that aligns with our purpose and our values, that is very powerful because that has the potential to dismantle massive corporations. We need to use that power wisely. When we talk about feminist leadership in political space and more formal structures, um, one good example is feminist foreign policy. So that means aligning the country's values and the direction of the, of the country with the leadership. So this is a government policy. It is driven by feminist politicians and hopefully backed by a feminist populace. It's centered on human rights, on dignity, on equality. 
And there's a big emphasis, obviously, on, on women's rights as human rights um, as a guiding principle for, for feminist foreign policy. It's intersectional, clearly. It is a new understanding of power that has the potential to be radically transformative in every space. It's about peace. It's about security. It's about development. It's about progress, not just for women, but for everyone. And it recognizes that we have to dismantle the old structures if we're going to build something new, because these were the structures, racism, sexism, misogyny, patriarchy, the stuff that was holding us back before. It centers people and their lives. It focuses on peace, not just as the absence of war, but a real, sustainable, meaningful peace. It's about agency. It is about a, a country and ultimately a world that is built by all of us and for all of us. So that's really radical in the way that it, it, it changes the way we think about how a country can, can govern and set an example. So in terms of, of feminist leadership that um, these feminist foreign policies are, are espousing, it's about participation, collaboration, accountability, humility, a really interesting word in that sense. Uh, it's about modeling feminist principles and purpose at a micro and a macro scale. It is about a shared vision. It's about challenging patriarchal norms. Um, it is about values. It is about setting examples. It is about um, building relationships that are based on trust and respect and opportunity. Um, it's about personal and collective care. Um, all of these things can translate also into the workplace. So in an office, in, in another space, you know, what might that mean? In any space that we all occupy, we need to ask ourselves, who is at the table? Who's doing the talking? Who's doing the deciding? Who's absent? Whose voices do we need? It's about challenging those structures all the time. It's about dispelling the myth of meritocracy. No, the system actually isn't fair. We have to fix the system because it's fundamentally flawed. Power can be shared. Power is not a pizza. It is uh, something that we all have the ability to access and need the ability to claim. It is about dignity. It's about respect. It's about modeling the right kind of behavior that ultimately will be contagious. This is about building a better world for everyone and your behavior as an individual matters. So it's not just about being a senior person in politics or in the workplace or anything. It is about changing yourself so we can change the rules. It's also about things like temporary special measures that discriminate positively in favor of women, like quotas, because things won't evolve on their own. Um, we need to rectify a historic imbalance, and to do that, we need to make sure that women have a seat. And that means creating the space to level the playing field, to take account of this historic disadvantage and fix it, because otherwise we're waiting for evolution, and I personally will not wait 100 years for the gender gap to close by itself. I don't know if anyone else is planning to be around. I'd like to fast track this because I think there's nothing more important than this right now. But at the same time, when we talk about the presence of women, that doesn't necessar necessarily mean power for women. So we need to make that distinction and make sure that the presence is meaningful and that the environment is enabling and women not just have a seat, but they have a voice, they have space, they have respect. Uh, all of those things are important. And at the same time, it's not just about politics and work. It's about how you espouse feminist leadership at home because if your feminism is just nine to five, it's not real feminism. So unless you have absorbed it and applied it in every aspect of your life, you know that's the real leadership for me. You cannot switch it off at 5 p.m. when the day is done. It is a 24 seven thing. Uh, once you put those lenses on, you will never be able to take them off. It's also about encouraging Feminist funding. You know, what we say right now is we have the, the so-called localization agenda, another buzzword that I don't care about at all because it renders quite hollow. What it, it is trying to emphasize is the funding of local women's groups, feminist groups on the front lines that are doing the work, that have always been doing the real work, that will do the work long after everybody else leaves. And yet we don't do that. We provide short-term, uh, restricted, structured, uh, funding that is uh, short in terms of its vision, short in terms of its dollars, short in terms of its duration, and does not provide the kind of opportunity for these feminist groups to sustain, much less to scale. Um, so we are actually depriving them of the opportunity to grow and to survive. So I think we really need to change the funding modalities and look at what feminist funding really means and how we can use our dollars and allocate our dollars in a way that is meaningful. Because what we know across the board is the status quo isn't good enough. There's, I don't think there's anybody that will argue. Well, maybe there is, but certainly not me. 
And I think we've flooded the world with all of these good arguments about equality and why that's important for all of us everywhere. We talk about economic arguments like, like more prosperity if more women are brought in. We talk about political arguments like peace and progress and all types of things. But really for me, the underlying thing is about principle. Feminist leadership is about principle and now is the time to do it. It's a non-negotiable. It's about the systems and the structures that need to be reestablished to serve us all. Change is happening too slow. And I, I believe that change is possible. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to get up every day. And I do wake up every day for this. So the case for feminist leadership is strong. And I would call on all of us to look inside and ask ourselves, am I aligned with my purpose? What am I doing in the world? And what am I doing for the world? Am I a leader and how do I manifest that leadership and how do I hold up a mirror for others to see their own leadership? Do I share power? How do I use my voice for myself to say what needs to be said and how do I use my voice in service of others? And am I working to reform the processes, the systems and the structures and the institutions that held us back but now need to hold us high? So I would say that feminist leadership is about building a better world for women, and it's a world that we all deserve now. Thank you. Well, hello again, everyone. Um, thanks to Lena Abirafe for that uh, wonderful and challenging uh, discussion. Um, there's a number of highlights uh, for me in that. Um, I loved uh, Lena's reference to our power not being a pizza and being able to be shared by all of us. Um, and a number of things really resonated for me. Um, for those not in Australia, we've had a, what I would say is a real reckoning around um, gender equality in our nation's parliament over the last few months, uh, which has been sparked by some, some absolutely horrendous instances of sexual harassment and abuse and rape occurring within the parliament itself, um, which I think has been very confronting for many. Um, and at the end of the day, the parliament, like anywhere, is a workplace. and. And of course, this kind of culture and conduct is completely intolerable in any workplace. But there's been a real reckoning as a result. And Lena mentioned things like the need for special measures if we're going to close that gender gap in less than 100 years. Um, one of the debates that had, we've had in Australia has been around quotas for female representation in the parliament. And the governing party, the Conservative Party here in Australia, has historically always opposed quotas for a range of reasons which they uh, claim had merit. But what I found really interesting is how those reasons seem to have melted away almost overnight in the face of the sustained public pressure and, and anger that has uh, poured out as a result of the unearthing of this sort of conduct occurring within a parliament. So thanks very much to Lena for her presentation. Uh, it's a wonderful um, opportunity for us to to think about those issues and to delve into them in our panel discussion, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, our next uh, speaker, uh, as I introduced earlier, uh, the talk is entitled Ethical Encounters in Aid, and it's one that I'm really looking forward to person, personally. Uh, so Abi uh, Baguas is a humanitarian and development professional, and he's the founder of Aid Reimagined, an initiative that helps usher the evolution of aid towards effectiveness and justice through an interdisciplinary lens. He's a fellow at IRAN, I-A-R-A-N, a collaborative hub of humanitarian professionals who provide independent foresight and strategic analysis to humanitarian ecosystem actors. Having worked for global organizations, including ActionAid, Save the Children, the Red Cross and UNICEF, Abe has experience in humanitarian response, program management, policy, strategy and research. And I'm sure Abe has seen both the good and the bad that um, comes with working in big uh, global NGOs like those mentioned. Uh, Abe is originally from the Philippines and he's a graduate of the London School of Economics and the Ateneo de Manila University. Abe has a specific interest in evidence-based policy, complexity and systems thinking and decolonizing development and humanitarian aid. Um, as a, a executive in a humanitarian organization myself, I know that uh, we have daily uh, conversations and, and we grapple with uh, the ethics around how we work. So I'm really looking forward to Abhi's talk, can you please make him welcome? Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. I find it funny how I'm in front of all of you today wearing my Filipino textile blazer and wearing my Philippine-inspired watch, 
having been invited as a guest speaker because of my ideas about decolonization and because I've championed the global south. It's funny because I haven't always been this way. After Spain colonized the Philippines, we were then colonized by the Americans. Our public school system was established by the Americans and the medium of instruction is in English. Outside school, my friends and I would consume American movies, TV shows, books. By the time I was in university, I had a particular worldview, one that blamed all my country's social ills in the backwardness of our culture and our people. I thought if we only had Western style, political and social systems. Today, here I am. I first came to Europe in 2011 for an internship to teach cultural awareness to young kids in Austria. Many young people from the global north do their gap years in the global south to teach school children. I did the reverse. During a team meeting with my fellow interns, someone brought up the issue of racism and how might we incorporate this in our workshops. Now, having grown up in the Philippines at a time when social justice discussions were not as prevalent in social media, race and racism was not at the forefront of my consciousness. I had a very limited understanding of the subject. Embarrassingly, my limited knowledge of racism in the Western context came purely from movies and TV shows. And back then, they were not as woke as they are now. So in response to my fellow intern, I wondered out loud, racism, isn't that gone now? Little did I know the discussion with my colleagues that followed was the beginning of my education about race and social justice more broadly. An education that continues until today and which to a large extent brings me here in front of all of you. I bring this story up because it contains the central insight to what I'll be talking about. That is our transformation through encounters. The encounter between what's known as the Philippines now and the Spanish and Americans changed the course of my ancestors' futures. My encounters with Western systems and social and cultural worlds shaped my worldview then. And my encounter with the concepts of power and social justice once again transformed me. Encounters are the story of the human adventure. Social change, development, destruction, recovery are all brought about by encounters. Nothing in this world is in isolation. Even communities that live in areas far from modern society encounter animals, plants, trees, rocks that shape their way of life. Yes, humans can encounter not just other humans, but nature too. In her most recent prize-winning book, Anna Tsing, a renowned anthropologist, conducts an ethnography not centered on humans, but on mushrooms. Speaking not just about the Matsutake, the most expensive mushroom in the world, which can only thrive under a very specific interaction between very specific types of trees insects, fungi, and soil, but also speaking about all the kinds of people that encounter each other in their quest to harvest this mushroom. Southeast Asian refugees, American war veterans, Japanese capitalists. Anna Tsing says, quote, staying alive for every species requires livable collaborations. Collaboration means working across differences, which leads to contamination. Without collaboration, we all die. Transformation through collaboration, ugly and otherwise, is the human condition." End quote. Humanitarian assistance is a kind of collaboration, an encounter between people who are in crisis and people who want to help. There are many versions of humanitarian assistance, from one family member helping another to spontaneous acts of kindness by our neighbors. Today, I'm interested in a specific kind of humanitarian assistance, what we call humanitarian aid, which typically happens between people and organizations from the global north and the global south. It's an encounter that happens when we deploy to other countries, sign partnership agreements, or form project teams. In many respects, humanitarian aid is the most noble expression of our altruistic nature. It defies earlier evolutionary expectations 
that humans will cooperate only with close kin, but compete with everyone else. Today, the impulse to help a stranger in distant lands has become a multi-billion dollar industry comprising approximately 40,000 organizations, which employ by some estimates around 250,000 individuals. In both natural and social sciences, growing evidence paints a picture of humans not as homo economicus, the selfish man, but as homo reciprocans, the cooperative human. Humanitarian encounters have undoubtedly led to a lot of good, but obviously we know aid is plagued with problems too. At the very least, aid can be ineffective. At worst, it can do more harm than good to its intended recipients. But beyond aid effectiveness, there must be a consistent. In other words, it is enough that we ask, did we do things right? We should also ask, did we do the right thing? If a project intends to build health clinics and train health workers, and it successfully did that, and it effectively reduced mortality, then we know we did things right. But do we know if we did the right thing? What if the NGO-run clinic reduces mortality now, but disrupts local public health systems, leading to increased mortality in the future? What if 10 years later, we find out that the expat country director abused local staff? What if modern health practices were taught in an insensitive manner that undermined effective indigenous health practices? Many humanitarian practitioners and scholars have grappled with the ethics of aid. Hugo Slim, author of Humanitarian Ethics, wrote about how the fundamental humanitarian principles, humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence, are the best tools to grapple with ethical problems. Jennifer Rubinstein, who wrote Between Samaritans and States, a prize-winning book on the ethics of humanitarian INGOs, offer pragmatic techniques in solving ethical puzzles. For instance, the INGOs are only guilty of their contributions to intended unintended harms and not to the actual harms themselves, or that it doesn't matter how INGOs got power. What matters is that they do not abuse it. Both Slim and Rubinstein, however, don't sufficiently acknowledge an underlying question. Who gets to decide what's the right thing? The default starting point of most ethical analysis in humanitarian aid has always been the white foreigner. In his book, Slim says that in making moral choices, there is a need for empathic deliberation. He says, quote, we need to imagine what it feels like to be them, end quote. But who is doing the imagining? Who is them? And is imagining enough if one does not have the lived experience? Meanwhile, Rubinstein's book focuses on Global North actors and admits that she did not interview aid recipients in her research. The question, who gets to decide what's right, has been even more urgent in the last year especially as INGOs have become more dependent than ever on local staff because of COVID-19, and as anti-racism and anti-colonialism was brought to the fore by movements like Black Lives Matter. The ethics of aid has implications not just at a project, organizational, or even sectoral level, but on how people and communities shape their societies and their futures. For example, I was once involved in a disaster risk reduction or DRR program in Zimbabwe, and our team commissioned a research to look at the lessons and challenges around indigenous DRR knowledge. The research found that communities were finding it difficult to pass on their indigenous knowledge because younger people were being provided Western-centric scientific education in schools. Guess that kind of reminds me of my past self. But in this very complex situation, what's the right thing to do? The world we want to create is shaped by our values and our values are shaped by our identities. And aid workers have diverse intersecting identities, not just as someone who is black or white or Asian or indigenous or from the global North or South, but also as part of the LGBT community or as migrants, both are true for myself, as a woman, as a person with disability, and so on. Because of our world's social, political, and economic history, our identities are tied with power. 
and the power dynamics in wider society are reproduced in the aid sector too. So it's not just a question of who gets to decide what's right, but also whose decision matters. And often it's the ones made by white, cisgendered, heterosexual, well-resourced global North aid workers. So we have arrived at our main dilemma. Given our identities and the power differentials that come with it, how can there be an ethical encounter between a global North dominated and driven aid system with global South actors and communities? I propose four guidelines. First, we need to tremble in our ignorance. We are so certain in humanitarian aid. At the technical and operational level, we create perfectly formed log frames and Gantt charts that show we are so sure our inputs and activities will neatly lead to our outcomes. We are also so sure our projects will succeed. Just look at the language we use in our fundraising or in our proposals. Give us your money and we will, we will save this child's life. And we supply this certainty because donors demand it. In grant making processes, they ask us, how will we ensure we will mitigate risks? How will we ensure people's participation? At the higher level, we are so sure of our own raison d'etre that we must intervene and that it must be us who should do the intervening. We are so sure our actions designed in the global north are what the people want. Our northern organizations and ways of working are the best route to achieving our goals. And our northern principles and norms are shared by all. With this arrogant certainty, encounters and aid become an imposition. But our certainty is an illusion. Stanford academic Leif Wenner argues most aid projects are not evaluated and most evaluations are unreliable because they are not rigorous enough or are written by the very agencies that are being evaluated. On top of not evaluating well enough, we're also not listening. The 2020 Humanitarian Accountability Report shows that aid agencies score lowest in their ability to welcome, address and com welcome and address compla complaints. Further, there is a paucity of lived experience within our sector. Most decision makers are still predominantly white and from the global north, which limits our ability to know whether we're doing what's right. I think we need to tremble in our ignorance a little bit more. How might encounters in aid change if we introduce more humility? Perhaps we'll be a bit more honest about our failures, a little bit more eager to learn and to listen, and a lot more careful in our actions. Second, we must strive to live with our contradictions. I've recently worked with a couple of organizations to help them address racism and colonialism in their programs. One organization is currently grappling how to continue their work in radically transforming our Northern dominated system while working within the system by receiving funds from Northern donors. Another is a philanthropic organization whose endowment is linked to colonial enterprises in the past, but is today a very progressive organization that offers unrestricted multi-year funding to activist movements. I asked dozens of aid actors, including local and national aid actors, what is their reflection on the histories of the organizations and donors that support their work? They, of course, had diverse answers, but one in particular captured the spirit of many responses. Matty Hart, the director of the Global Philanthropy Project, a membership organization of foundations supporting LGBT movements in the Global South, says, quote, I live with that contradiction. At this stage, I have comfort in living with things that don't make sense. I don't have to make everything make sense. I don't have the power to, end quote. And I think this is right. In many of our encounters in aid, there is a growing trend to seek purity and perfect coherence. We insist on clear distinctions between global North and South aid workers, even though our identities are more complex than that. And I'm sometimes guilty of this. We believe either reform via incremental changes 
or revolution, burning down the house is the only way, even though the evidence and social change tells us both are necessary. Such encounters can be totalizing. I think a healthier attitude is to get comfortable with our contradictions and complexities. As Immanuel Kant says, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. Living with our contradictions does not mean a blanket permission for lesser evils or an uncritical compromise in pursuit of justice. It means, for example, navigating the tensions between standing up versus stepping aside or valuing local perspectives versus challenging what we think could be harmful norms. It means encountering other humans as they are and the world as it is instead of demanding perfection and trying to do the right thing. Third, be a plumber. Many problems in humanitarian aid, including racism and colonialism, can be described as structural or systemic. Most people imagine structures or systems to be like scaffolding, the fixed metal bones of a building in which parts can be rearranged or dismantled. In my work to address racism and colonialism in humanitarian organizations, I found that most of us in the aid sector are not deliberately racist or colonial. This is of course not reflective of the wider world. Our sector seems to naturally attract more liberal and progressive people, although not always. Don't get me wrong, there are probably some genuine white supremacists in aid and there is a prevalence of white supremacist attitudes and behaviors. But I've found most aid workers are well-intentioned actors, although they find themselves under pressure. Aid workers experience organizational pressures, for example, in growing their income or implementing projects to a high standard, and sectoral pressures, such as prioritizing donor requirements over accountability to affected populations. When a machine gets too much pressure, Valves and levers are used to release or pump stuff to counteract the pressure. In aid, we similarly use valves and levers, like investing money and effort in being, I don't know, agile and acting rapidly, in technical standards and expertise, and in bureaucratic procedures to ensure compliance. But this can lead to an imbalance. We emphasize agility over being careful and mindful of our interventions. We focus on technical solutions while overlooking political problems. Our bureaucracies turn everything into a checklist, but forget about relationships like people's embeddedness or social ties. This shows how systems are less like scaffolding and more like plumbing, described by the social scientist Donna Lamedos as composed of valves, levers, and dynamic stocks and flows. So if we want to have a more ethical encounter, we need to learn to be a plumber. Being agile or technocratic or bureaucratic are not inherently bad. In fact, they are necessary if organizations want to perform well, but they overflow because of the plumbing of our organizations, one that is maybe geared towards income growth or market share instead of genuine impact. The imbalance between the stocks and flows of say, being agile, technocratic, and bureaucratic versus being careful, political, and relational can be a fertile ground for acts of domination. And when these acts of domination are mostly done by white faces in Northern organizations, it is experienced as racist and colonial. So who's to blame? I think it's less the aid workers and more the bad plumbing. Speaking about social inequities, the indigenous scholar Tyson Yunkaporta says, quote, I realized it is not enough to examine individual thoughts, words, and behaviors. We need to look at the hidden systems of control that are shaping our responses to these power structures. We need to stop looking sideways at each other to identify victims and oppressors. We need to start looking up, end quote. Or should I say, we need to start looking underneath and look at the plumbing. 
Donella Meadows says, quote, being less surprised by complex systems is mainly a matter of learning to expect, appreciate, and use the world's complexity. Blaming, disciplining, firing, twisting policy levers harder, these standard responses will not fix structural problems. But system traps can be escaped by reformulating goals, weakening, strengthening, or altering feedback loops." End quote. To resolve AIDS broken plumbing, we need to learn how to be plumbers so that we can tweak the right valves and levers that prevent dominance, racist, colonial, or other kinds from happening in the first place. The final thing we can do to be more ethical in our aid encounters is to enjoy the pluriverse. Ethical encounters require conviviality, the Latin roots of which mean living with each other. Conviviality today means to enjoy, and enjoyment is done together with others. To enjoy the pluriverse, therefore, is to live with each other's worlds, or to use the idea of the Zapatistas, to live in a world in which many worlds fit. I invoke the idea of the pluriverse because we must resist the imposition, the dominance, the dullness of what author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie calls a single story. We do this in our daily work, repeating tired, outdated tropes about the people we serve, copy-pasting interventions without regard to contextual realities, measuring success in singular ways, expecting grassroots movements to mimic our organizational forms. But we also do this at a higher level when we remove the ability of people and communities to create the future, the world they want for themselves in which their own values are reflected in their relationship with nature, their version of what peace looks like in attaining what they consider to be wealth. Pluriverse does not mean we are irreconcilably different from each other. No, we are all human beings after all, and we share a collective responsibility to be good stewards of our planet. But pluriverse means we all have our unique expressions of our humanity and stewardship. Lately, encounters have felt miserable. Our humanitarian ecosystem, our grant management bureaucracies, cluster meetings, project reporting, appear boring, even inhumane. Meanwhile, we languish while we doom scroll on our social media, where we read about funding cuts by Northern donors or another sexual abuse scandal, alongside news about racial violence or government abandoning their people in this pandemic. In the face of such misery, joy becomes a radical act. The Zapatistas valued laughter and dancing. Tyson Yung Caporta wrote, quote, we can't always be grappling with the complexities of the universe. Sometimes we just need to play, end quote. What if we built enjoyment of the pluriverse into our humanitarian encounters? For instance, as suggested to me by Jabu Pereira, director of Iranti, an organization that supports lesbian, trans, intersex, and gender non-conforming movements in South Africa, in funding projects that have locally defined joy as its goal, or by building convivial relationships between INGOs and local partners that deeply appreciate our unique expressions of humanity and stewardship. We must find joy in living together in a world in which many worlds fit. Anat Singh says, we change through our collaborations. The important stuff for life on earth happens in those transformations, end quote. In the same way that I was transformed from a narrow-minded Filipino who hated his own country to a cosmopolitan with a deep appreciation sa aking pinanggalingan for the place from whence I came. So how might we be transformed by ethical encounters in aid? One in which we tremble in our ignorance we live with our contradictions, we learn to be plumbers, and we enjoy in the pluriverse. Well, let's find out. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Abu, for that uh, brilliant presentation. Uh, so much in there resonated for me, and I can see from the, the lively uh, chat that there's a lot that resonated for all of you too. Um, the notion of trembling in our ignorance is a, a wonderful one. And you know this dichotomy we face where our donors are asking us for almost arrogance in the certainty that we put forward around our interventions versus the humility that we need to take into the communities uh, where we're seeking to make a difference is one that really stood out to me. And Abi, I'll have to tell my wife about your um, notion of humanitarians being plumbers. We've recently moved house and she's often lamenting that I don't have a more practical trade to help us out in our home improvements. So now I can say, well, we are all plumbers in this humanitarian sector, even if that doesn't translate into any practical assistance. Um, I want to introduce our next uh, panellist for you today. Alina Soji Atta is the founder and CEO of the Karam Foundation. Uh, she's a Syrian-American architect and writer from Aleppo, named one of the 50 women groundbreakers changing the world in 2020 by Worth magazine. Her articles and essays have been published in the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, Foreign Policy, Politico, The Atlantic and BBC. She's appeared on CNN, NBC News, BBC, Huffington Post, NPR and many other media outlets. Lena has uh, spoken about the Syrian humanitarian crisis at schools and universities and institutions around the world, including Harvard, the University of Chicago, Johns Hopkins, Northwestern University, the King's Academy in Jordan, the Aspen Institute and others. Uh, Lena is also a co-founder of the How Many More Project and serves as the chair of the board of directors of the Syria campaign and is a non-resident fellow at New America. Uh, Lena's uh, talk today is entitled Beyond the Buzz finding humanity in humanitarian language. And we're really excited to welcome Lena to present to us now. Over to you, Lena. Thank you so much, Matt. And thank you, Arby, for your very inspiring talk. Hello, everybody around the world. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And I really appreciate being invited to give this talk about my work uh, with Syrian refugees. In December 2012, I visited Syrian IDP camps on the Turkish border for the first time. The makeshift camps were filled with thousands of internally displaced men, women, and children. So many children. Rows of plastic tents were nested between the famous olive trees of Idlib and Aleppo provinces. There was no access to running water, no proper schools, no playgrounds, barely any shelter. It was too hot in the summer, and when I visited, it was blistering cold and muddy. Nothing in the camp eased the sense of dread and despair for the thousands of people who had fled their homes out of fear of the bombs. They had risked everything they had and everything they knew on a single bet, that it would be better here, in this filth and misery. They also bet that this situation would not be permanent. Millions of Syrians since have lost both bets. In fact, for some families, camps sometimes prove to be even more dangerous than the bombs. While I was there, a tent burned within seconds in the middle of the night from a candle. Two children died, Dia and Fatima. I remember thinking as I walked between the tents, where are the humanitarian agencies? Why are these people sleeping in flammable plastic tents emblazoned with blue UN logos? Why was there no running water and electricity? And why are people relying on dangerous candles? I asked many questions like these over the past years. The questions evolved with the brutality of the conflict and the scale of the crisis that would soon become one of the largest of our lifetime. Why were Syrian refugees drowning in the Aegean Sea after paying hundreds, sometimes thousands of precious dollars to merciless smugglers who sold them a spot on a leaky boat and charged extra for fake life jackets with spongy material that absorbed water and transformed to deadly anchors instead of floating pillows? Why had countries like Germany declared that its borders were open to 1 million Syrian refugees without creating a way to get them there safely? In the age of Uber and Airbnb, somehow we couldn't figure out safe transportation for refugees. That was too hard. As if somehow they had to prove they were worthy of protection only if they literally swam and walked across the continent. Why did massive floods and winter storms decimate the makeshift camps in Lebanon where hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees lived? And every single year, we watched the big aid agencies launch their emergency appeals, 
every year the emergency was winter. And every year the solution set up the tents once more. Why had hundreds of millions of dollars of aid not been used to build sustainable shelter with dignity that survived the seasons? Or better yet, why had we not taken action to end the conflict at its source so people could stay in their homes and cities and stop becoming refugees in the first place? That question was a tough one because apparently to be a humanitarian, one had to be politically neutral. I learned in the past 10 years that neutrality stands in opposition to our humanity. It's been a decade since the Syrian crisis began. Sorry. It's been a decade since the serious crisis be Syrian crisis began. It started peacefully as a revolution against tyranny. People marched across the streets in Damascus, Dara, Hamas, in villages and towns across Syria, chanting freedom and dignity. Today, whether you are one of the almost 11 million Syrians who have become refugees or one of the 12 million people remaining in the country, half of whom are displaced and the majority of whom are in need of aid, you have found neither freedom nor dignity in your existence. And yet, glancing at the websites of the most prominent aid agencies over the years, you will find campaigns that fundraise for Syrians and refugees, glossy photos, intimate stories, brilliant successes. In the media, we read coverage of refugees in mostly two ways. The heroes, the refugee who started a chocolate factory, the Olympic swimmer uh, sisters, teen refugees who pulled the boat full of people to the Greek shore. The refugee tailor who saved a wedding and rushed to fix the zipper on the bride's dress in Canada. And then there are the victims, the child with the dirty face and hungry eyes begging you to save them with a donation, the desperate mother, the wretched father, the message was clear, be inspired beyond belief or feel pity and donate out of guilt. Everything revolved around fundraising, but to what end? In our world of nonprofits that most of us here are from, two of the most common questions on grant applications and reports are sometimes impossible to answer. How do you measure success? How do you measure impact? What is success? How well a camp is run or how fast it is dismantled? How many people served or how many people no longer need service? Or better yet, how many people served who become of service themselves? Are we talking about building a future or continuing the cycle of need? That day in 2012, I realized as a leader of a humanitarian organization who is also Syrian, who is also a human, my desire for this camp was at opposite end of the agencies that were working there. I wanted the camps to be gone tomorrow. The agencies, however, knew from decades of work in other refugee crises, crises, the refugees in camps were usually there for an average 17 years. This later has become 21 years. Syrians had a different view on this fact. They weren't going to accept it. As the founding director of Zatari Camp in Jordan famously declared, we built them a camp, but the Syrians wanted a city. Imagine that, people not wanting to live in a camp for 17 to 21 years. I believe the Syrian tragedy drove big aid to think differently about the automatic humanitarian response toolbox. This is a 20, this was a 20, this is and was a 21st century crisis and needed language to match the times, technology, innovation, scaling, social impact, inclusivity, and so many more words became buzzwords for websites, social media, and TED Talks. Today, I'm going to talk about three of these words to redefine them and reclaim them. The first is innovation. By definition, innovation is the concept of introducing or using new ideas or methods, having new ideas about how something can be done. Because of the technology boom in the past two decades, words like innovation and disruption have been, been used so much they've lost their meaning. In the humanitarian space, it seems every agency has an innovation department or lab. Innovation is exciting because it always gives the impression of something new. But true innovation is much deeper than a new idea. It's doing things in a new way or looking at problems through a new lens because the way we've been doing them is broken. At Karam Foundation, the organization I run that serves Syrian refugees, particularly the youth, we think of innovation as a lifeline. It's really the only way you can find a pathway out of the tragedy to the future. Refugees and survivors of conflict need innovation. They need new solutions, but they also need to be co-creators of these solutions. This is Yusuf. He's a Syrian refugee teen living in Istanbul. 
Yusuf grew up in Duma, outside Damascus. He served, as a child, he survived, survived a chemical weapons attack, a forced starvation siege, and multiple displacements until he arrived to Turkey, where we met him in Reyhanle first and then in Istanbul. At our Kerem houses, he learned complex design programs and how to build projects in our maker spaces. He started an initiative in his Turkish public high school to teach his peers these computer design programs, his Turkish peers in Turkish. The school created its first technology club and elected Yusuf the first president. He is now applying to university and helping his friends at Kerem House to do the same in their schools. Yusuf reversed the narrative of what a refugee youth can be and what they can offer a host community. Who is now the visitor and who is the host in Yusuf's world? This may look like a shiny tech success story, but it's not. This isn't, let's teach all the refugees how to code and we can solve the problem, or vocational training 2.0, nor is it look at him, he's a hero. This is strategic thinking. Give people the tools, the most cutting edge tools, the tech, the mentorship, the confidence, the safety, the agency, the healing, and then watch them soar beyond, their expect beyond your expectations. This is innovation, new ideas on how things can be done. The second word is resilience, the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, toughness, the ability of a substance or an object to spring back into shape, elasticity. How we love to speak about the resilience of refugees. I'll confess, I love to speak about the resilience of refugees too, until I realized something during the pandemic. Suddenly for all of us in the privileged West, living in extreme uncertainty and fear, being weak was okay. Not only okay, it was celebrated. But with refugees, we celebrate their resi resilience, their toughness, their capacity to recover from difficulties quickly. On top of that, we expect refugees to get by with minimum intervention. Programs are designed and born out of the same principle of scarcity that most aid solutions favor for refugees and marginalized communities. Maximum impact equals maximum numbers. A sprinkle of aid to large numbers equals impressive annual reports and low overheads, but where is the real change? Education is just one example of this. Give marginalized kids just enough to get by. Any schooling is better than nothing. But is it really? What about a child's mental health? What about teen socialization? What about the importance of face-to-face -face interaction with competent and empathetic teachers? All these things that we know so well now. Last year, I spoke with Abir. She's a young Syrian widow living in Burj al-Barajne, a Palestinian refugee camp with six children, three of them tri triplets who were born refugees. In 2015, Abir's husband stepped out to buy diapers for their four-month-old babies. He never returned home. He was killed along with 42 people in a bombing claimed later by ISIS. Abir's older daughter suffers from the psychological trauma of that day. She had beautiful handwriting once, Abir says, but now she can't speak properly. For the older three children, virtual school has been a challenge. They have one smartphone to share and Abir can't keep up with online learning. For the five-year-old triplets who are looking forward to starting kindergarten, Abir finds a cynical silver lining in the pandemic. I'm happy that schools are closed for everyone now because I can't afford to send them. Jawahir, another Syrian refugee woman in Beirut, was kicked out of her building with her four children last summer. The Lebanese landlord no longer wanted Syrian tenants who might spread the virus in his building. Her family found a new home that was near the port. When the blast last August shook their building and shattered the windows, the children ran outside barefoot under, on the broken glass screaming like they used to after the bombs fell on their village outside Aleppo. After the dust settled, they kept asking her, is it a war? Will it be like Syria? Tell me, is it a war? Her oldest, cell, her oldest son, Omar, 12, worked for a while with her to provide for the younger kids, but the odd jobs they were able to snag have disappeared between the, eco the economy and the pandemic. She doesn't think that she can afford school for them anymore. How do you stay at home when you barely have one or study online when you don't have Wi-Fi or a smart device? The expectations are insurmountable. Why is resilience expected of the oppressed and the marginalized? Why do we marvel at their ability to overcome obstacles and despair while the rest of us can focus on self-care? There's a double standard. Who gets to be resilient? Who gets to be vulnerable? 
I love the definition of resilience as elasticity, the power for an object or a person or a community to bounce back into shape. How do we collaborate together to create the spaces and communities that allow everyone to bounce back into shape after a tragedy, hardship, a pandemic, a war? How do we use our collective vulnerability to create collective resilience? And instead of starting from scarcity, we start from generosity, radical generosity, giving everything to those who've lost everything, not just a sprinkle. The third word I'd like to address is leadership. Leadership, anyone who takes responsibility for recognizing the potential in people and ideas and has the courage to develop the potential. Leadership, it's been used so much that it almost no longer has a meaning, almost. If you're Syrian, however, it has a very specific meaning, al-qa'id, the leader. For Syrians, that's one person, Bashar al-Assad, the current president. Before that, it was his father. For over 50 years, Syrians have had one name, one portrait, one family, one possibility that swallowed all of our names, stories, selves, potential, and possibilities. In contrast, over the past 10 years, we've seen what Syrians are capable of doing when that fear is lifted, even at the most terrible price of trauma and displacement. I've witnessed hundreds of Syrian refugee youth thriving when given the opportunities and the tools. At the Kerem houses in Turkey, Syrian refugee teens are given the chance to claim themselves as their own biggest hope. They are their own agents for the future. Just a few months ago, I watched two Syrian refugee girls, Haula and Rua, present their project to redesign the popular online game Among Us to become more and more interactive one in real life. They were coding live on Zoom in front of their mentors, guest critics, and peers. Another young teen in Istanbul, Ruba, started her own Instagram baking business during the pandemic. Farhad started loaning the laptop we gave him to attend his university online to Syrian high schoolers in Turkey who could no longer apply to university in person because the pandemic had shut down the centers. He took the initiative to extend what he had received far, farther than what we had envisioned. That is innovation, that is impact. It's the ripple effect of success and it is leadership. At Kerem, we are on a mission to build 10,000 leaders by 2028, true leaders in the true sense of the word, reclaiming the power of that word. 10,000 future stories, portraits, images of young Syrians taking care of themselves, their families, and their communities. 10,000 possibilities for an alternative to authoritarianism and oppression. 10,000 people like Farhad, Youssef, Ruba, Batul. These young people and thousands more are proving every day that Syrian refugees are much more than their tragedies and trauma. They're brimming with potential and endless possibility. Last, humanitarian. To be a humanitarian is to embrace your full humanity and extend it to uplift others while believing they are capable and worthy to embrace their own. One of the biggest lessons of 2020 is that we're not immune to global suffering. We are not immune to fires, floods, viruses, or even authoritarianism. You may not be from bombed Aleppo or crippled Beirut, but in the last year, we've all seen terrifying glimpses of how fragile our cities and lives really are. Resilience cannot only be an expectation we have for other people who are struggling. Those coveted stores of resilience, like herd immunity, are built up over time in community. We cannot be well until we are all well. And collective wellness must begin in the words we use and how we speak to each other. To say the words we mean and mean the words we say. To dig deeper beyond the buzz and the slick marketing. To cut to the heart of the stories that say something different, even if, especially if that story doesn't fit the narrative we need to raise funds. We need to listen to the hard questions that don't make the inspiring TED Talks. Why did I have to drown to prove that I was worthy of living in Europe? Why am I separated from my parents? Why wasn't I given a chance to go to school? Why can't I reach my full potential? So I ask you, how should we measure impact? How should we measure success? Building a community is about embracing our own humanity and humility to say yes to the people we serve. Yes, you are worthy. Yes, you are capable. Let's walk together, learn together, and build together. Let's make something better, something more beautiful than what we have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lena, for another uh, fantastic and powerful talk. Um, 
I'm sure a number of your um, statements resonated with a lot of people. And for me, I really love this uh, juxtaposition you posed around resilience and, and vulnerability and um, the almost double standard that we're asked to reach there. And the, the connection there to leadership, I think, is really strong too. And, and feminist leadership, indeed, I think, relies on this notion of vulnerability in leaders um, and this contradiction we see when we're asking people to be simultaneously resilient and strong and vulnerable is, is one that we're really keen to explore in our work at Seven Children too. So thank you very much for that and for that challenge. Um, we have about 20 minutes for our panel session, so I want to move on fairly quickly to introduce our, our panellists. And we all heard uh, yesterday a really fantastic opening uh, challenge from Deegan Ali, and Deegan joins us as our guest panellist here today as well. Uh, Deegan, as you heard yesterday, is the Executive Director of ADESO, has more than 20 years of hands-on experience in the humanitarian and development field. Deegan's a strong believer in transforming the current aid system to give more power and voice to local communities and civil society organisations. And following this belief, Deegan continues to innovate and develop new solutions to build the infrastructure that will truly shift power and resources and including the co-founding of the Network for Empowered Aid Response or NIA. So welcome back, uh, Deegan, um, today, and thanks for joining us to the uh, panel. And uh, Lena Sergiata and Abi Baguas are also joining us on the panel discussion. So please turn your, your cameras on and get ready to turn your microphones on, uh, guest panelists. And um, we do have a few questions that have come through online already. So. I want to pose one that I think is probably directed to you, Arby, first, but I'm sure uh, Deegan and Lena, you might have views as well. And the question's about the, the decolonisation of aid and the reimagining of the aid sector and how that sometimes tends to tag humanitarians and aid agencies into a fairly binary category of either international or local. Uh, so you can be either uh, an international and part of the power hoarding in the past or you're local and which I'll query, referred to as the future, but constrained and belittled by the oppressive international system. Um, so it, the question is, is there a, a possible hybrid? And if so, what would that look like? Albi, let me uh, pose that to you first. Well, thanks very much for that question. Um, and, you know, as I've said in, in my talk earlier, it's more complex than that, right? We have different identities that, um, you know, cannot be simply categorized as, oh, well, I'm from the global north or I'm from the global south. People who are part of the diaspora or people who are refugees who are not living in their regions anymore, they also, you know, how, how would you class them, right? Like, or how would you kind of like uh, measure their kind of like tie to the region? So it's more complex than that, certainly. Um, for me, I think there are two things that are really important. Um, first is the social ties. And the second is the tacit knowledge. So th this is the deep contextual knowledge that is not easily translatable um, in you know, reports or documents or whatever. And I think these two are really important. And in fact, a lot of um, studies, a lot of people have shown that these two are really important in, in making um, programs more effective, but also more just. Um, and to some degree, this is re related to proximity, right? So the closer you are to the context, if you're part of that community, then, uh, yeah, well, to a large degree, this is related to proximity. But in terms of organizational forms, I think there, there can be many different forms. There can be many different types of organizations that, um, that can promote these uh, two things that I've just talked about. And of course, if when I said proximity to a greater degree is correlated to that, then that means ideally it's, it's organizations that are um, in their local context. Um, and I think that's uh, that's the ideal. But of course, um, yeah, organizational forms exist and there are diverse organizational forms. So um, yes, I think I think it's possible to have a hybrid, but proximity is really important. Thanks, Abi. Uh, Dagan, do you have a perspective on, on this? Is it possible to have a hybrid? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I agree with Arby. Um, I think those two things about contextual knowledge and proximity are really key and network. Um, and I think that it, INGOs have tried to develop this hybrid by nationalizing a lot of their uh, offices and saying we have a national country director, a national team, a national board, so therefore we are national organizations. And this is 
um, and in my opinion, a very the wrong path to take. And it doesn't demonstrate uh, these things. And what the, actually happens is that these INGOs who are nationalizing are taking the space and resources from indigenous local organizations who have far more proximity. Um, and oftentimes it's done for the wrong reasons for fundraising purposes, because they've realized that there's quite a lot of money in the global South or because they don't have the money in that office to sustain that office. So they nationalize them rather than leave the country completely. Um, so these are not genuine reasons, in my opinion, to nationalize um, when you could be exiting and using the resources that you're still gonna be using to subsidize that new um, member of the confederation by helping civil society, indigenous civil society who have much more genuine non-elitist proximity to the community. Um, because many of those staff that you have that are running these institutions are part and parcel of the DNA of the culture of INGOs and the system. They are not people who have sacrificed their resources, their time to establish their own civil society organization. It takes huge amounts of courage and sacrifice, both financial, mental perseverance. These things, are, they don't know about that. They've all just earned these nice salaries and come from elite uh, universities um, in their countries and they become part of the middle and upper class. Um, so for me, that's a complete contradiction to what we continue to espouse the rhetoric about really truly supporting local humanitarian leadership. If we are genuine about that, support indigenous civil society organizations and don't compete against them. Thanks, Degan. And uh, Lena, did you wanna offer a perspective on this question too? I think both what Deegan and RB said were very, um, cover a lot. Uh, just from my experience working um, as a local NGO inside Turkey, and our team are almost all of them are Syrian refugees themselves. We, we And we've partnered with many organizations on the ground, both inside Syria and in neighboring countries. And as an outsider to the aid agency structures, like I'm an architect by training, so I came into this because of what was happening to my country. Um, we've seen firsthand how these kinds of structures have actually broken down a lot of the energy, specifically for Syrians, who a lot of them became refugees after being part of the revolution, and, um, and there are a lot of young people and a lot of disrupted lives, and then coming into Turkey and wanting to do something to help other refugees as well and wanting to build something and the INGO um, atmosphere really sucked this energy in and kind of taught people, you know, a very different way of, of, you know, thinking about aid, aid exactly the way that Arby was talking about it. And so what we find is when we're even hiring people or working with people as a team is to kind of unlearn those lessons. Um, at the same time, we're outsiders. And so it's it's not easy at all. And and the, and the, and it's, it's a, it takes a lot of time to say, you know, these are this is not necessarily the best way, even if that was a large organization and you had large salaries, but it not necessarily has the impact of what we want to do which is to create a different future that we envisioned for the country. Thanks, Lena. And I should have said that uh, first question was from Thomas Lay. So thanks, Thomas, for the question. There's just a build on this, that I, and then we'll come back to a couple of other issues. But there's a question here from Margaretha, uh, who says, what do you think about local organisations in the South that also start to go international? And we've seen this sort of thing happening in places like Indonesia. Um, Abi, uh, any Thoughts on that? Sure, yeah. No, I completely agree with um, both Tegan and Lena as well. Um, you know, it's it's about the kind of like the imposition, right, of, of uh, the expectation of, you know, what it means to be a humanitarian actor. And I think, you know, we have to ask ourselves, okay, so why are um, local South or global 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 South, sorry, or local organizations trying to mimic um, these organizational forms um, from the global north. And it's because, um, for example, access to funding or access to um, sort of like networks, you're excluded if you don't um, mimic that organizational form that, uh, you know, usually northern organizations or donors um, expect of you. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think that's a problem. 
uh, I think I think this kind of like imposition and expectation is a problem. Um, and I think, you know, my question would be then, how can we create a global system where we actually welcome and accept different organizational forms that may not look like your traditional, you know, INGO may not have the same policies and processes, but can still do the work because there are, you know, that's probably most of local grassroots organizations. They don't look like, you know, your Save the Children's or your, um, I don't know, Oxfam's, but they can do the work. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it's a good challenge, isn't it? And I think we need to sort of take this challenge to donors as well, who often want to fund the organizations that look and sound and feel like the systems and organizations that they're used to, rather than you know, trusting the indigenous uh, systems and, and cultures and mechanisms that exist. Um, Lena, I want to ask you a question. Um, this one comes from Sophie Roth, and her question is, I work with a group of young Syrian men, and many have internalized that the only way for them to B is the strong, resilient, oldest son, brother type um, and mentality. So how do we encourage forms of self-care relating to mental health for young people who have internalised this because they feel like they have no other option? Yeah, that's a, it's a huge problem and a huge crisis. The mental health and the trauma of refugees is just it's so massive and it's at a, such a huge scale and the pandemic made all of it um, escalate even more. So um, it's a very hard question to ask. What we've found in our work is that actually the, um, the creative and innovative uh, programs that really take people, first of all, creating the safe space for people to be in and then being able to challenge them to actually build something. So we talk about giving tools, but not solutions. And then just creating this very safe social space for people to be together and create a community. I think building that community is really the foundation of all of the um, support, mental health support that people end up giving to each other. I think um, for instance, and this is some, an example of, um, you know, I'm Syrian American and we have certain views and, cu and cultural views. And so when we first started working and opening Kerem House, we had a very specific view of, this is a space for teenagers and it's mostly a very conservative um, society, but we, I, we were very adamant that we wanted the, the studio sessions to be mixed boys and girls because we didn't see a reason to separate them. But a lot of times in the culture, this was not as, like a natural thing but what we did was we had many many sessions with the parents to um to basically explain that we just want to have these um, more holistic spaces and we're going to make it very natural for people to be together and you're in this host community and this is the natural way of things moving forward and when people when parents realized that this was coming from a space of um that there is no agenda um and 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 they, they we began to build bonds of trust this happened what happened Happened later with the boys and the girls is that they realized how much they gain from each other. And I think that in that way, um, a lot of the boys that are in Karam House, they begin to have that kind of resiliency and that kind of, um, you know, social um, empowerment coming from being in this very safe space that's a very natural space and that's one of the things that we it was an unintended um, result, but that's what happened. And I think the more we do that, the better for everybody. Fantastic, thank you, Lena. Um, a question here, um, building on one of the, the ideas that Abi um, talked about in his speech, but I want to ask you, Degan, on this. Um, Abi introduced this idea of trembling in our ignorance, the you know, embracing the ignorance of, and not pretending that we have all the solutions and, and as donors and others may require, that sort of certainty or arrogance and instead being comfortable in being ignorant of the solutions. Um, the question, this is from Nazanin uh, Zadeh Cummings. What do managers and people with power in organisations need to do to encourage this kind of thinking in their teams? Um, Deegan, do you want to have a go at this one first and then I'll ask Abi and Lena to come in? I think we have to, um, that, that whole thing about shaking in ignorance is about humility and uh, we have to model that behaviour ourselves as leaders. And we have to tell our staff, I don't know, I don't have the answer. Do you, you know, what do you think? Um, or I made a mistake. Um, 
you know, we shouldn't have done this kind of project or we should, you know, this is one of the things that actually I find so um, just really disappointing in the sector is how failure is never talked about and it's never acknowledged, it's never rewarded. Um, I've been very naive in the past thinking that publicly talking about our failures was something that we would get patted on the back for. But in actuality, we would be, uh, people would say, oh, they don't have credibility or they don't have capacity or they don't have this or they don't have that. When I know for a fact, I NGOs and UN agencies who are failing every single day, every single day in programs, but they never publicize it. They always have an external consultant or an expat come in, put these nice, beautiful reports together, great communications material. Everything is 100% success. When I know on the ground that that project was a complete abysmal failure. Um, but, you know, so it's, uh, it's really sad that because we just are not, and then we talk about innovation, but how are you going to innovate if you learn from failures, you know, so there's a huge contradiction in the sector and every single thing that we do. And I just don't understand how we can continue to function in this dichotomy and this, you know, very surreal way of operating. It's not natural. And uh, I, I don't, I don't personally have an answer to that question other than saying as managers, as leaders, uh, going back to what Mina was talking about in terms of leadership, it is our responsibilities and incumbent on us to engender a culture of accepting failures and saying, I don't know, and really practicing humility with our staff. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And this this notion of feminist leadership being vulnerable and and showing that we don't have all the answers, I think, has been key to success. And in a lot of the the leaders we've seen handle things like the pandemic, well, like a Jacinda Ardern, uh, et cetera. Um, Arby, uh, did you want to reflect on, you know, what you see as a way to encourage this trembling in our ignorance culture in organisations? Yeah, no, thanks. Um, and I completely agree with Degan. Um, exactly that. It's about sort of like humility and acknowledging our failures. So, I mean, like one easy, I think, way to do this. Here's a challenge for all big INGOs. In your next annual report, maybe put a section on failure, put a section on, you know, what didn't work well, but then don't spin it. Don't spin it as in, oh, it didn't work well, but we did this. And so it turned out a success. Just put a box of failure. And then, um, yeah, just be honest about it. Um, and, you know, what, why you think it failed and how, you know, how you think, um, yeah, this might have impacted communities. Um, a challenge to donors is to look at the wording of your proposals, for example. Um, you know, wh why isn't there kind of like a bit more humility there? Why, why is it always, how do you ensure? How do you ensure? Well, we can't ensure anything in this world, right? Like it's, it's all uncertain and complex. So, um, yeah, like just tweak the tweak it so that you know failure is more honest. Um, and then I think I'm I want to make a point that um, you know ultimately it's it's you know how to encourage trembling and ignorance. Um, and I think ultimately it's it's about decisions, right? And it's it's not the decision making per se; it's the decision makers. Um, and we're ignorant because a lot of the decision makers are, you know, they don't have the right information. They don't have the lived experience. They don't have the, 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 the contextual knowledge um, of, 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 uh, of the places where we work. And so maybe try to change the decision makers, put, put local people, put affected people um, in your boards, in your decision maker in your decision making so that maybe you don't have to tremble in that much ignorance. Um, we have to tremble because we don't have that knowledge, but you know, uh, we can we can always change the decision makers. So yeah, that's my yeah. response. Thanks, Abby. And a great tip, I think, for the annual report. We have tried failure fests at Save the Children, but not many people turn up, unfortunately. <laughs> We've got to get that culture of, of less fear of failure working through the organization. Alina, did you have any final observations here before we wrap up um, this section of the proceedings. I just want to thank everybody. I really agree with Dakin and um, RB on this. And I think it's really powerful 
to be able to be humble and to be vulnerable and to be a leader that accepts um, failure and accepts ignorance. Um, we've also, you know, the example that I gave to talk about leadership, specifically in the Syrian political context, it's very difficult because first it's a word that people are very scared of because nobody was ever allowed to be a leader. It's something unthinkable. Um, so we challenge our students and kids and families that, you know, everybody is responsible to become a leader in your own community. And being a leader is not somebody who knows everything or somebody who's going to dominate or somebody even is going to be in the front, like the front facing person because there's many leaders that are very shy and introverted. And what we talk about leadership is actually being a responsible citizen wherever you are and wherever you end up living, whether it's in Turkey or Europe or you get to America or you go back to Syria, but you have this responsibility as a leader to continue doing the work and continue to uplift others and make that make the work continuous throughout the next generation. And so I think it's also, it's hard for us even with refugee kids to teach them that distinction between having being a humble leader is not as easy as it is even with refugee kids. And, and that's something we, we always make a very big point of doing because it's very easy for people to get all of this knowledge and, and actually say like, oh, I know everything now. And then we're like, oh, actually let's go back because we don't know everything and we need to be humble and we need to always be talking about how, um, how we need to continue learning. So I think it's always a, a work in progress. Yeah, really well said. The more we learn, often the more we learn that we need to learn, isn't it? So <laughs> exactly. thank you so much. Um, so that's a, that's a wrap for this plenary session today. Um, thanks to all our panellists, uh, Lina Abi Rafa, who kicked us off, uh, Abi Bagoas, um, Lina Sergi Atta, and of course, Dagan Ali, who's joined us for our panel. Really fantastic discussion. Uh, thanks to you all. And please do hang around in the CHL conference. There's a, a networking session or a series of lightning panels now. If you follow the live program through your conference portal, uh, please do hang around. And thanks very much for being with us today.